to a single word. Okay. Maintaining conservation. How long have I gone for? 35 minutes. Okay. So maintaining conservation. There's the political and, and social side and the ecological. And some of this will overlap. But again, I want to inflate some of this with literature that, that we have come to accept. And this is uh, a piece in the journal Science by Bill Adams, who's at, the, uh, at Cambridge University. And again, th biodiversity conservation and eradication of poverty are often cited together as potential win-win situations. Right? <coughs> that if we provide biodiversity conservation, there's tourism, there's lodges, there's guides, there's all these other things. And local peoples can stop destro destroying the forest and engage in this very good livelihood that involves tourism. Right? And as a result, you take these two goals, conserve biodiversity and poverty alleviation, and they'll magically occur. And anyone who tells you it's a win-win situation is lying through their teeth. Okay? There's never a win-win situation. And if, they, if you are finding a win-win situation, you're not looking hard enough. But in this debate that um, Bill Adams brought about, and this is a paper in Nature, they just discuss these. They discuss the problems surrounding biodiversity conservation and the alleviation of poverty. These are two very separate realms. You don't have policymakers at the national level talking about how biodiversity conservation can alleviate poverty. The poverty question is always directed towards you know, the Ministry of Local Planning or the Ministry of Employment and so on. And the biodiversity stuff is in the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife. And, we like, and while we might think that they communicate, that is often not the case. The second one that they identify in part of this, this outline is that poverty is a critical constraint of conservation, right? They're poor people, they have no other alternatives, therefore they destroy, they destroy biodiversity and threaten conservation, right? But they also say in that same vein that conservation should not compromise poverty reduction. Now keep in mind, we're talking about long-term view here, 20, 50 years out. Right? Is it possible to actually have these twin goals of poverty alleviation and conservation happening at the same time? Or are these separate policy realms? Right? Does a conservationist truly care about alleviating poverty? Does somebody who is interested in alleviating poverty clearly care about conservation. These are very separate things. And here is another argument that they raise. And again, there is no agreement or disagreement here. They are simply raising these points. Poverty reduction depends on resource conservation. Certainly see that with plantation forests, right? providing those opportunities. You see it with the tourism. Now, this is all the debate surrounding integrating co communities into conservation as if we, if we so decide that communities are a threat to conservation. And certainly you see that. But I just want to draw, and this is a paper that is circulated to you, I'm, I'm really not in the habit of showing my own work, but, but really what I describe here is when it comes to tourism, we should really be quite careful about the narratives that are being emitted both from tour operators themselves but also from ministry officials responsible for this sort of stuff. Tourist visitation is highly structured. Look at the maps that you got from Bali. What features are they showing you? Roads, campsites, park headquarters. Right. If you go on a safari in East Africa, you are so wholly dependent upon your driver guide for knowledge, you don't know whether what they're telling you is actually accurate. I've seen driver guides, and I go sometimes as, as a passive observer in one of these tour vehicles, and they will misidentify species, they will misidentify causes of degradation or environmental change, right? And yet, 
the whole idea of a tourist is predicated on a viewing experience with a single guide. And sometimes when you reach places where you want more information, it is so highly structured in the form of a booklet that we accept that as a universal truth. Right? Here we have to think about enforcement of what is considered the right nature versus the threats to nature. What is the nature that we want tourists to see and what is the nature we do not want tourists to see. When we went through Bali, not very many of you noticed it because you were so preoccupied with the red wolf that there were two huge mining pits in the middle of the, what is it called, the Seneta Plains, Seneta Plain. In the middle of the Sonata Plain, there was a huge mine where gravel was being extracted for the road. On the road up from the lakes where we got out, there was a half a mountain that was completely demolished. Again, I need to stress this enough, conservation integrity will only work when you put those, when you put the issues that are being confronted into a political and historical context. When you ignore history, you ignore the future. Right? And so when it comes to integrity and figuring out what is likely to happen 20, 40, 50 years out, the clues have all been laid out for you, they are all in the past and they are all in what the contemporary politics are. Now historically we can, you know, we can sort of victim, we can villainize protected area officials as not being, not listening to some of the constraints. But I think we need to broaden our horizons and actually look to see all that local knowledge that they have actually been quite careful to listen to the constraints of local people, but that listening does not actually translate into effective conservation policy. I think we had a fairly well documented encounter where we discussed uh, some of the positives of tourism. But you know, I think when somebody says they offer tourism jobs, you know, as again, we are thinking about integrity for the long term and you are saying, oh, this protected area will only work if we have more tourist visitation, to draw in revenue, to provide employment. These are often very menial jobs. They do not provide any real opportunity for advancement, right. I think Hailu asked the question of uh, the, the lodge that we went to, the number of people that you employ versus the total population of the village was very tiny percentage, right. And there is this mentality of something is better than nothing, right. And I think we need to really stop and pause for that and sort of say, well maybe that is why we are in the trouble we are in because we have relied on that same type of thinking. Oh, it is okay, we will provide a little jobs in year, a few jobs in year one and then when we become more established, then we will add more people and then we hope that the lodge expands and then there is political crisis in the country, tourism visitation drops. What happened to those promises, right? When we talk about local communities, like when we went to Rira, we so enjoyed our lunch, we forgot to look beyond the village, right? complex cultures with very long histories of settlement. In this part of Ethiopia, the Oromia, the Oromo people have incredibly complex cultures that even anthropologists have trouble sort of deciding, uh, thinking about what is really going on, what are all the different cultural attributes, what are the different practices, what are the different norms, what are the different standards, but we reduce them down to simple stereotypes. Mona. Yeah, do you want to come this way? Sure. So what, what you are saying is that tourists are ignorant because all they want to do is go have a nice lunch and then get back in the bus and go somewhere else. That is often what happens. I'm not saying all tourists. Yeah, I'm saying often that is what happens. The, the reality is that that's probably what generally tourists want. They want a little bit of fun and then back to their jobs. That is a great point and here I want to bring up the point of who needs educating, local people or tourists? Well, I, I do not think you can educate tourists. Why not? Because they do not care, they just want to relax and they go back, then they go want to go back home. I do not think But then why should that become the problem here? Why should their ignorance 
bear the problems of conservation. What I'm trying to say is that you probably overthink what tourists can do. Um, I, uh, think of think of no think of somebody coming from Addis. They want to go for the weekend, see the red wolf, and then go back to work. They right. don't have time to read and think, and you know they just want to relax. It's their vacation right. time. That's that's a totally valid so argument. We are, they are not but that, I am simply saying that that arrogance and that ignorance I don't think that's gonna is happen. what leads to these particular problems. And I don't think that you are. That's that's fine. That's fine. Hundreds of thousands of people. I don't uh, think there is a single money. area where tourism has brought on these vast economic reaping rewards for the common individual. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, we, we visited a park that had 2,000 visitors and then right. we visited a park that had 10,000 visitors. Even, right. even 2,000 visitors trying to educate, to make 10,000, 2,000 visitors be more uh, sensitive to long history and, you know, community complexities and whatnot. I think it's it's hard to achieve that. I, I, I don't disagree with you on that. I don't, I, simply, I don't disagree with that point. I would simply say that there has been no cultural education as part of conservation. I have a question. Yes. And maybe you can make your input and it can be open to everybody. Okay. <coughs> Speak up loudly so that yeah. the others can hear. So my question is, what is your, what is your opinion on evicting people who have, who have the heritage tied to that land from that park and keeping a lodge for tourists? Um, that's a great question. Did everyone hear that? Um, Benedict has asked me, what is my opinion about eviction for local people and then keeping the tourist lodge? Right? Yeah. That's such um, as in Rira. Yeah. Such as in Rira. Um, here's my, my point. Why can local people not run lodges themselves? What if they don't want to do that? How do we know? We have not asked them. Or what if they don't have the capital needed to build the lodge? Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> so maybe conservation priorities should shift. If tourism is the centerpiece for conservation, right? Across the world, tourism funds conservation. Hi, Luke. Yeah. Wait, 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 I gotta come there. I can't read this. Okay. Just to answer for the, for, for, for the question that you raised, why uh, the local people build the ledge? The main thing is, one, they have not skill how to manage tourists by themselves. Right. How to uh, promote yep. their lodges, their properties. At the same time, they have not enough money to build. Of course, sometimes there are community lodges that were just started in Semin Mountain National Park. Yeah. Actually, tourists love that rather than to yeah. the luxury lodge. Right. But the main, the main problem here, they have not skill how to build, how to manage, and how to... I, so Hailu's point here is that, well, a potential obstacle to that, not a potential obstacle, but a big obstacle to that, is where are those resources going to come from, right? Where are going to get the capital expenses? Where are they going to get this from? Now, remember that piece on biodiversity conservation and poverty? 